Welcome back to Hashing It Out. This is a personals episode with David Theodore, security researcher, engineer at the Theorem Foundation. Uh, welcome, Dave. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Corey Petty with Jesse Broke. Um, David, why don't you do the normal thing and kind of start us off by introducing yourself, telling us how you got into this ecosystem in the first place. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Theodore, uh, security research, uh, consensus layer security research team at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, how I got into this industry. Uh, I think, you know, I, I stumbled across security in general uh, in college. I, I wiped, I like reset windows on accident and I had it was like 17 pages into a paper and uh, started looking into data recovery. I was a broke waiter at the time, um, not a CS student. I was an electrical engineering student. So like one programming class. Uh, in the meantime, I discovered Linux for forensic reasons and I recovered all of my data. Um, and while that took, you know, 12 hours to, to rip through looking for magic numbers on the file system uh, on an old hard drive, I was like, what is wireless penetration? What is hash cracking? Uh, I never looked back, went into security. About two years later, I found Monero um, looking into anonymity research on the dark web. That led me to Ethereum, had a good buddy that was like an early Ethereum investor, um, Started doing smart contract audits in 2017. Really the only use case was ICOs back in the day. Uh, that didn't really pay the bills for too long. Uh, huge bear market winter. Uh, so I, I went into the defense industry, uh, exploit development, network operations, uh, working with intelligence community predominantly, but some DOD stuff. Uh, from there into uh, malware reversing, did some malware reversing in Android at Google. Um, and then Ethereum kind of approached me with a, hey, we know you're an ETH head. Uh, we need some researchers to help secure the merge. And the merge was a very interesting target. Um, and I, I just got obsessed, brought some other guys from the defense industry in with me. And uh, yeah, I never looked back, loving it so far. What's it like being a security researcher um, for a project that's tantamount to like rebuilding a plane while it's flying? <laughs> There's, yeah, there's some good and bad things. Um, I'll say that like my previous experience with security research was mostly in, in the DOD and IC groups and um, the targets are different. So I think a lot of the design decisions that the Ethereum Foundation and the contractors made early on to use memory safe languages has changed the playing field. Um, bugs that we see like in a previous life would be much more likely to be exploitable. You can think like all these types of memory corruption bugs, like, you know, buffer overflows. Um, you have all kinds of like double freeze, use after freeze, all kinds of fun heap stuff. Now what we see is more um, like logic bugs or just like denial of service space bugs, like a panic and go or rust, um, which is absolutely drastic uh, still. Uh, there's not a loss of funds in these cases. People aren't like, getting remote code execution on your, on your box because you're running a node, but they're able to stop your node from running. And if you have a client penetration, that's, you know, 40, 50% of the network stopping the, the nodes from running, especially in a proof of stake system could prevent finality. So it's definitely different. Um, the moving plane analogy aspect of it is very interesting. There's no, like, let's, you know, my father-in-law was like, yeah, hey, when are you guys going to do the upgrade? Like you're going to, you know, announce a, a downtime and reboot the <laughs> network and, you know, uh, Ethereum doesn't go down um, and hopefully never will. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the gracious handoff of the baton from proof of work to proof of stake was definitely added a lot of complexity. Um, now, having said that, like the multi-client architecture and other things kind of make it to where, you know, leading up into merge day, we're like, you know, we're worried about bugs in individual clients, but at the same time, like we're pretty, we feel pretty good about network health, save any like vast, uh, like maybe unknown or like partially known, but unexpected to be abused uh, issues with the spec itself. So I'd say, you know, overall, um, def definitely a different, a different monster from the security game. Um, like I said, no loss of funds, things like that aren't the deal. Um, but definitely having this, I guess the thing that makes it so tricky is that it's permissionless. Having this, this network anyone can participate in and having this very open stage uh, where there is value just invites a lot of potential um, avenues for abuse. So it's, it's definitely been a fun thing to, to look at. Oh, I know you were complaining that your node went down and a few other people within status also, their nodes went down during the merge. And so they spent this past week trying to get their, their clients oh, yeah, back. I had a, 
I had a rare bug with Nethermind, I think, that, or a hardware fault. I'm not sure that uh, basically had my, ex my, my execution layer client just not syncing for the longest <clears> time. And so I wasn't for the first, I guess, three days, I wasn't testing or doing anything for my validators, which is real fun, especially when you're trying to get work done during those days. But yeah, uh, all is smooth now. And I even have a backup system in case it happens again. <laughs> I don't want to use the cloud. I hate using instances of the cloud if I can. So uh, it's expensive. To too. Go it really is, especially if yeah. you want some of the level of performant gear and bandwidth. Um, it's just like bandwidth allocation for some of the stuff. It can, if you're if you're not careful, like you can rack up a pretty pretty penny in using cloud infrastructure. It can almost offset like the uh, the APY that an individual validator can can actually generate, especially when prices are lower, like right now. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, we're on a security podcast, so don't use the cloud anyways if you're putting oh, wow. your <laughs> your proposer keys on there. Yeah. Um, how, how did so they approached you and said you were an F head. So like, have you have you maintained being an F head, quote unquote, this entire time? So after you after you left, because like I'd imagine if you left from doing security reviews or security audits to a, at the time probably just a shitload of ICOs, you were a little uh, disillusioned when you left, especially with the price coming down. Did you maintain yeah. that kind of exuberance? So when I say like left, I didn't really like leave. Like I was never affiliated with the Ethereum Foundation previously. Um, and when I say they like approached me, it was actually more like ETH community that I knew approached me and they were like, Hey, I know this guy. Um, he's a good security engineer, security research background also understands Ethereum. Um, and so that was, and also like, I'm a huge believer. So I have one of my best friends. Um, I lived with him in 2017, the house in 2018 we lived in was bought with, with ETH games of his like been following the ecosystem for a long time. And I think that um, having a few Ethereum OGs say this guy knows his stuff because we talked to him about Ethereum all the time. Maybe, you know, if Ethereum has grown up and could pay the bills, kind of like Google and, and these other um, good engineering firms can pay, that he might be down. And then I think what what turned the tides is um, a few of the, the kind of uh, like PM types at the Ethereum Foundation went and crawled my Twitter, which I'm not real active on Twitter. But like I was tweeting about like Bitcoin in 2015 and and I was tweeting about how proof of stake was going to be a game changer in 2018. You know, so it's not like these concepts were new. Um, part of the problem I think that they've had is, you know, there's there's only so many firms that um, are really adept enough to audit uh, crypto stuff. It's the, the prerequisites for crypto are like, you got to understand distributed systems. You absolutely have to understand like a vast amount of cryptographic primitives, which is like exploding right now with all the ZK stuff. The the like it's not going to get any better either. Yeah, the Venn diagram when you got somebody that can like audit this stuff gets like real, real narrow, real thin. Um, and I think that you know you could pay six months for an audit from like a you know a decently respected firm um, for doing security reviews, and they might spend the first three months like wrapping their head around. Um, you know, just what is Ethereum itself? We'll price that in too, if you don't shop right. <laughs> yeah, and their findings won't be, you know, their findings won't be that great because they didn't start truly reading the code until they wrapped their head around the spec. Um, yeah, and there's also, there's some, this was actually one of the most attractive things to me. There's some new, uh, like primitive pillars of security when it comes to crypto. Um, and, and, and the way I say that is like, I guess like, Previously for me, um, I, there's, when you get into security, there's like so many very like pigeonholed areas of expertise. And I did a lot of software reversing, a lot of security research with software. So the way, like if somebody asked me like, oh, are you a red teamer? And I would just say yes. But if it was like a pen tester or somebody that like specifically did something, I'd say I'm a software security researcher and find bugs in software. I do a lot of fuzzing, static and dynamic analysis, all these kinds of things. Um, and that's, like a little bit too in depth when you're talking to somebody that's not security focused. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you have, you have to have like this understanding of not only a bunch of new cryptographic primitives, right? Like an, a good security researcher understands like checksum means that the data's got integrity if they match. Uh, they understand the difference between like asymmetric encryption for key exchange and symmetric encryption for like full disk encryption. And then after you've already like made a, you know, a good encrypted tunnel for communication, but they don't understand any of the ZK stuff. 
Um, they don't understand like these BLS signatures that we have in the consensus layer. Like the whole idea is that you have a public private key and you can sign a message, but you can aggregate the signatures and kind of squash them into a fixed data amount. So you, there's like these new things that haven't existed. The whole internet's been built on basically checksums, asymmetric and symmetric encryption. And now we have like homomorphic, which is all the ZK stuff, all these other things. And the other side of that is there's this new pillar, right? And it's like economic security, um, which is so interesting to me. Um, proof of stake kind of dabbles in it, but you see like, I'll put it this way. So you have a really complex protocol. It's found a way to like gen generate revenue, um, you know, whatever have you. We've done audits. The, the code is completely secure. Everything, the oracles are locked down. If we don't like make the incentive design correct and we like make it possible for somebody to like flash loan like so much of the protocol to make a vote to change something, the whole thing crumbles. It doesn't matter how secure your code is anymore. There's like these new, these Well, new... there's a weight. It's, a, it's, a, it's an additional weighting factor that you haven't had to ever think about beforehand because it's like, what's the cost of doing this? And how does the economic weighting of the underlying network change like an attacker's motivation to, to, to take that cost, which is something you typically have to do. And so yep. like for, for the longest time with smart contracts, the, the best metric for a specific methodology for programming solidity was measured by how long that thing had been on the chain with, like, combined with the amount of value that's locked up in it. Because there is no better way to like to say like it's a pretty good way of doing it. This is one million F secure, or however much mm -hmm. value is locked into that thing, and then you can do additional tests to gain more confirmation. But like, there's nothing better because no one's going to release a known vulnerability if it's if it has the potential to gain them so much more when value is locked into that thing more often, right? Which is interesting about the merge and all the kind of novel and new cryptography and technology built into it is that now there's a shitload of value on the line. And so you're yep. starting to see that same metric come into play of like, this is secure for this amount of value locked up for this amount of time. I guess, what is that TVL? I guess the standard metric, like that what you call yeah. it. Yeah. And I think, so let me like ask the, you, go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to ask you a question. So when you, when you're talking about incentive design to compensate for like flash loans and people exploiting, you know, contracts, how do you, how do you actually compensate for that? Um, I think, I think you have to just approach things a little bit different. Um, I'll put it this way. What is that? Like, if I try to boil down what the difference is here is that um, just like in traditional security assumptions are made, like, like people will say, okay, I just assume you're not going to give me a negative link value here. And so if I give you a negative, if you're not filtering for that and I give you a negative link value, you know, you have things like Heartbleed where we're reading memory from the kernel processes way off in the distance or whatever. The same thing happens with the economic security here. And it's that people have this deal, they like design the system, and then they don't think about um, the adversarial ways that you could change the state. So like the in this current state of this contract, everything is secure. But one way to change the state is to flash loan like a shitload of ape coin and then vote on their governance or get the airdrop during the time or whatever have you, right? Um, and so it's 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 all, these are basic like ideas and security that have existed previously. It's just now there's a new dimension of how can you change state? And a lot of that comes from external forces. Um, I think proof of stake is a great example of like the minimal, like new thing here, like trying to like, not many people can answer the question about economic security between like proof of work Ethereum and proof of stake Ethereum. Like how do you truly measure it? And so people will go to like, well, to revert history past finality, uh, you need to burn like billions of dollars. Like that's kind of how you can sum it up. Right. But I think, uh, you know, and it, it's very simple. It's like, it's like, you have these very simple rules, whereas these different DeFi primitives can be like insane, right? Like you could have these like decentralized oracles where um, if I'm honest, my reputation goes up and I can continue to be an oracle in prediction markets and say, you know, who won the football game or whatever. But someday it's going to make enough sense for me to tarnish my reputation and collect a billion dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like- My people... reputation is X amount of dollars worth. And so like, don't make bets that are more than that. Like, and that's a, like you said, it's just a new dimension to weight what 
opportunity costs are that yeah are are really 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 strange like I, and I'm, I used to do a lot of threat modeling and try and get people to do threat modeling across their code bases and projects and whatever and how to add that into the process of doing a threat model is kind of interesting like the like you said, they're assumptions. When you take flash loans as an example, it's like when people were building out early DeFi protocols, they made an assumption that it's not reasonable for an individual user to have this much money to do something. Yep. And then flash loans came along and then it gave everyone the ability to have way more than that much money to do something. And so the assumption was thrown out the window and everything that was built on that assumption was not, was then broken. And yep. that happens a lot. Every time, and then, and that's this, consequence of building on a shared resource that is i think a relatively novel concept for people where like if i build an application and I put it on ethereum i'm building it not only for myself but for everyone to use and i'm now at the mercy of how everyone uses it despite how i think it should be used yep it's a good way to put it the the coolest thing i've seen done that i haven't really seen done elsewhere um, and nobody talks about this group enough. Uh, there's the RIG group within the EF, the Robust Incentives Group. They run like intelligent RL agents in staking scenarios, uh, just emulated to see if there's like, you know, if there is incentives for reorgs uh, financially to see if there's like, you know, if we if we make a thousand honest validators, great, they all behave this way. If we make um, you know, a thousand honest validators, but 900 of them all like are owned by one entity. Is there a, a time and place where like that entity is willing to like, you know, slash and sacrifice 32 ETH, one of their validators to collect, you know, a, a, a huge like reorg meg, mev stealing payout, like on the other end. And like, this is the kind of, I don't think that you can expect the traditional software, like security auditor to wholly comprehend all of these things. So I just think that, you know, just like you have um, like somebody reviewing the crypto, like reading the actual like dissertation where they talked about how these two curves and the properties are and are they quantum resilient and all these like very nitty gritty crypto things, like that person's an expertise there. And then you have like the actual like software auditor, that guy's got that expertise. And then you've just got like testers that test the crap out of thing and write buzzers. Well, now you just kind of need these other people to be like, um, to do simulations. I mean, we do simulations in the stock market now, like this is not like a totally new concept. It's just that we're kind of taking, you know, game theory, which has kind of had its like golden age in the sixties and seventies and like brushing all the dust off of it. And then saying like, okay, we have way more complex crap now to model. Um, you know, where's the, like, where's like the 2008 financial crisis, like risk lingering, when we're, we have all these building blocks and we make all these assumptions and like, you know, DeFi is all like, great. But then if there's like actually an issue with maker, like what happens to everything that uses die as collateral and like, where are these ripple effects going? And, you know, as more, more actors get more and more complex and potentially collude, um, you know, you could see like, like all the Lido validators colluding or something um, and, and, and being willing to like, they know they have, you know, the next three proposers in a row. Well, why don't we reorg this dude out of the chain because he had a 50, 50 MEV or 50 ETH MEV block payout or something. So we, we kind of have to like, the only way to do this is to simulate it just like anything else. I mean, it's uh, from a security researcher's perspective, it's like, you, you know, fuzz, like fuzz and emulate all of the different scenarios. Fuzz it when ETH is worth $10, fuzz it when, you know, the peg is broken on the stable coin. Like, like take all these things and figure out where it might make sense to do this, right? I could see people like I'm surprised nobody did this. Like the the multi-block flash loan would have been epic at the merge. Uh, you oh, you man. already know <laughs> yeah you already know who the first block the first slot is the first proposer. If you could collude with them and you you mine the TTD block, you could take out like a gazillion ETH flash loan, and then you'd have and then you just pay it back on block you know slot zero of that post merge, and then you have like all the ETH proof of work in the world to dump into the market on that chain. There's all kinds of like cool little things here that didn't exist. I thought before. that that yeah. actually did happen. That somebody flash loaned ETH to dump ETH uh, proof of work. Never saw that NFT so. mint. I can I got I got overly exuberant NFT mint on the first block. There was an NFT yeah. mint that was like I think they paid like 500k in gas to mint like 100 NFTs, which is going to be small potatoes compared to what they get. You know, I wonder what that like merge panda the transition is the name of that NFT. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's awesome. But yeah, the uh, the the last block I think was mined by F two pool, and they mined it as a vanity block. They just like they knocked out all the gas. They paid you know whatever the gas fees was to like fill the block up. It was kind of like an epic like salute, like like we mined the last <laughs> block. You know, um, I thought that was pretty cool. So what do you what do you get excited about now? Like the merge has happened. Like Danny's crying in joy. What do we where where do we go from here? What are you excited about now that the merge has happened? Which is a like one a, a ridiculous feat of technology and effort to make it happen so smoothly. Yeah. But like that's no way, shape, or form like the end of the show. Yeah. Um, from the security side, there's a ton of work to be done still. Um, we've been doing all kinds of like emulation with all the different EL and CL clients. Um, we've been like fuzzing them with a third party tool by a company called Antithesis that basically will, as it's a deterministic hypervisor, the whole network is local. So like it's got determinism at the network le level and we like drop packets and we do all kinds of fun stuff. So that, that needs to be like kind of teased out a little bit. We need to throw MevBoost into there. Um, MevBoost is relatively new code. I've got a, a Go fuzzer that's like a breath first fuzzer I've been working on for the last few months. Um, going to open source that at DevCon. Going to point that at MevBoost at Geth. It's already pointed at Prism. The other cool thing, uh, one of the big security upgrades that like it's starting to take shape and the spec is kind of getting hammered out right now that I don't think it'll be in Shanghai in like the first set of uh, the first hard fork where withdrawals are enabled, but maybe the one after. And I'm going to advocate for it as soon as possible is SSLE. So the, the secrets, a single secret leader election. And basically what that is, is that uh, currently you can know block proposers a little bit ahead of time. Um, and so, you know, you could see a very, very targeted denial of mm -hmm. service on, on proposers as they happen. Um, I'm not worried about it so much in the short term because like botnets are just kind of like, if you rent a botnet right now, uh, they phone home like every 24 hours for the next target. And then they, you know, they're usually compromised IOT devices or whatever. And they don't like know how to take instructions every six minutes and denial of service, some individual IP for 12 seconds at a time, which is what they would need to do to denial of service proposers. But um, SSLE will basically use uh, ZK proofs to reduce the anonymity set and basically make a proof that says um, that like you can generate as a proposer where nobody knows who's proposing the next block except for the proposer who it is and they can generate a proof that they're the chosen one so like at the slot when they reveal their proposal they'll be able to reveal this little zk proof that's like hey this is a legitimate proposal that can be verified by everyone else and then no one will know you know well th they won't know uh, the whole anonymity set but they'll be like okay there's like one of twelve thousand uh potential validators proposing on this 12 second slot there's no way they could ddos all twelve thousand of them and still kind of have like the ion canon uh, throughput that they need to to nail the right one so that's kind of for me the the protocol like level s strengthening security upgrade in the near future that i'm the most excited about uh, there's also like just this green field of what we would consider like systemic things so obviously all of the consensus layer clients were you know uh very new and and proof of stake was new and a lot of it was theoretical and sure it's been done before but hasn't been done with like you know a trillion dollars of tvl on the network you know in the hot swap like well you know with nine different types of clients like all like seamlessly oh, yeah. hit, like that, that was a big thing to chew um now that that's behind us we've got l2s man we've got you know systemic things like maker like you know if if somebody can you know generate malicious fraud proofs and optimism and like cause double spin, like these are things that we've kind of made the scaling roadmap for ETH. So like we've got to lock them down too. Um, so our team is growing. We've always got people like looking at the consensus layer clients, but like also huge DeFi projects, all the L2 stuff. Another big thing is ZK. I mean, that's we're, we're the, the first parts of like any ZK tech are going to be the WISP stuff in SLE. That's going to be the first thing in the consensus layer. And it's very minimal. And like the smartest ZK people in the world have been talking about it. Uh, I watched Dan Crad and Vitalik and and uh, George Kadinakis talk to Dan Benet and some of the other Stanford people in the backyard, and they're just like elated, right? They've been working on all these cool cryptographic primitives since like the '70s, and now like we're brushing the dust off of their textbooks and like implementing them for the first time, and it's going to change the world. So they're always like down to help. But that stuff's like you know you could see scaling roadmaps. Like let's say that Starkware is able to you know make your transaction fees like sub cents right and and their state updates are tiny and you're like people are now able to like 
run World of Warcraft NFT minting levels of like mints. Like hundreds of millions of NFTs a day can be minted on L2s and like the transaction fees are like minimal and you can withdraw this and take this with you in the ecosystem. Like these are the next big things. I mean, car titles, loans, all these things. They're going to live in L2s. So if we've got like random bugs like the double spin bug and Zcash like hiding under the covers that we don't know about, like that's detrimental. Like that, that would, that could be something that could like harm. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's huge. So these are, and we don't have auditing tools for this. Like we're still like working on on on-ramping solidity auditors, right? And that's application space has not even been what I've been focusing on. Like I know enough to be dangerous and there's some really good people, but there's not enough of them. And now we don't have have any on-ramps for it, right? Like, so like you look at something that's reasonably new that I think is a relatively good on-ramp like Securium to try and train people Mm -hmm. to become adept enough to start being dangerous. It's still, it's still only focused on smart contracts because that's where, I don't know, it's easiest to get in, but it feels like when most people think about Web3 security, they think about it from a perspective of solidity, not everything underneath it, which is holding a tremendous amount of value. Yeah, and now you're gonna have to ask them to like understand elliptic curve pairings, multi-party com- um, computation, and it's like, hey, do you guys know like linear algebra and like all these complex cryptographic primitives? Because your ZK system is going to basically be built on these. And so it's like, not only do you have to understand the solidity, we have to understand like the prover and the verifier. And you have to understand all the ZK stuff that nobody really understands, right? We've got, I'm in these calls, right? With the Xerox Park folks. And there's these brilliant mathematicians and cryptographers that really understand ZK. And then there's like, you know, people that can implement it in code. And then we're in this call and we're like, how do we formally verify that these things are like sound and complete? And it's like, uh, like, no, like there's, there's a bunch of people that like have a piece of the knowledge and it's like, we're going to have to build that out. We're going to have to make best practices. We're going to have to like train people. Who are I these mean, PMs? Who are the, who are the people that are managing these projects? Because they need to, they just listen to them. most people that I know that have like a decent skill set in project management. Have no fucking clue what's going to be said in any of those calls. Yeah, that's kind of the problem, Rick. Right now, it's it's more like uh, industry. Like the people that are in the calls will be like like a formal verification company that like their bread and butter will like be doing these audits someday, and then like some zk experts, and then like the people that wrote the like compilers, right? Like the current like circom and stuff, and like probably eighty percent of them are academics. They're students. They're not getting paid these like big engineering salaries yet, right? So they're like kind of like. I could do this or I could go work for two Sigma, you know? And it's like, no, don't go do that. This is going to be bigger than that in a few years, you know? And it's, it's very uh, disorganized and, and it's, I'll put it this way. The last six months, it's like gone from completely unknown to like, now we have a roadmap. Like, let's make a, let's make a bug tracker. Every ZK bug that we've seen so far, let's get it in there. So we know like how to start classifying these things, you know, like we, we, we have, you know, terminology for previous types of bugs and we don't even know like what to do here. Right. And like how, how to call this. And so I think, uh, I think that's all very exciting. I think uh, I'll be focusing a lot on that. I have, a, I have an electrical engineering undergrad with a math minor. So ZK is just kind of like very mathy tied to what I, I think I should focus on. Um, but the space moves so fast. Like, I mean, like we're, we're one L2 with like, you know, a $10 billion TVL away from me being like, oh shit, I got to drop everything and go look at that. And like maybe hire some more people to, to kind of take a look at this, you know? I think the good news is that um, the natural bug bounty aspect of things, you kind of mentioned it earlier. I don't think we called it that, but like there's been a billion dollars plus in this contract for at least a year. Like those kind of like time will tell like how secure things are. Um, it's just, it's, it's a litmus test, right? I mean, Banks are still running mainframes, right? Why? Because like that was the first thing they built it on and it hasn't broken yet, you know? So I think- And the programmers are dead so they don't want to change it. So that doesn't help either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why Fortran will never die, right? Because there's nobody to, to, to translate it into C, right? But yeah, I don't know. I think uh, for me, like my risk perspective, um, I feel pretty good about staking ETH. Um, I, I, I feel good about which clients I run. And I've ran, you know, we run instrumented with like race sanitization, memory sanitization, ASAN, UBSAN. We run these instrumented clients. We fuzz them. We, so I've seen all this stuff that's under the hood. I feel pretty good about staking. I feel good, pretty good about like the economic uh, model of like the security model of staking. But like I'm not going to be putting 90% of my ETH bag into, um, you know, these L2s until they're like kind of tried and true. And I think that 
there's going to be a lot of promises for both privacy and scalabilities of ZK. But that's another one. Like if, if you go ask Dan Benet, who's like one of the best cryptographers in the world, a professor at Stanford, Israeli cryptographer, like just known in the industry, he will tell you like, I would be cautious about putting ZK into the consensus layer, right? Because it's like, mm -hmm. we think, you know, Don't roll your only own. Use like, it so you, need some, you need some years to harden these things. Yeah. And it's like, don't roll your own. And then it's like, okay, well, what's the next thing we need to build? Well, let's put the entire Ethereum virtual machine into a ZK proof. Like, what? Come on, man. Mm -hmm. Like, don't roll your own and then go straight. Well, at the same time, we have that motto. Like, cryptography has always had that motto. But like, some of the leads of cryptography, especially like things like threshold signatures and these, these new things are building this stuff. So it's not like novices or amateurs trying, like don't get me wrong, there's plenty of those too, but like some of the Titans are also building these things. Yep. And it's interesting to be in a position where like, oh, maybe we should roll our own because it's, we have the best people doing it. Like it's, it's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it'll be, uh, let, let everyone roll theirs, try to wrap my head around it, try to test it. And then like baby steps of putting my money into it. Right. Um, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll have kind of the way that you have like your cold wallet and your hot wallet mentality. Like I won't have more than I'd put on a hot wallet inside of a CK roll up, um, in the oh. short term. Yeah. But I'm definitely excited about it. Um, I think that there's also, there's like little semi-centralized things like, um, CK sync and, and DYDX was a great success, right? They had like, if you ever use DYDX, it's like, and I'm a U.S. citizen, so I don't use it. I've seen people use it. Nice disclaimer. <laughs> uh, <want> it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like instant transaction finality, uh, and maybe not finality under the hood so much like their state updates don't get rolled up, but like to you, it feels like that. And like they, you can force withdrawals and like even the people that got like frozen, they couldn't like make trades or even close trades in some scenarios because their wallet was like too many, too, too few hops from OVAC. They still have the ability to withdraw from that. And like, that's a really cool thing. Um, I think immutable X is cool. I think that there's like a lot of these like L2s where you don't necessarily need an EVM, right? You don't need the equivalent EVM at least. Um, the compatible EVM like does the trick or very uh, application specific things like, uh, you know, I don't know. You could just like make a, a small betting game or you could have, um, an L2 that just handles like, like, like state channels between two companies, like Wells Fargo and Bank of America, you know, they have millions of transactions every day between their different customers. Maybe Starbucks is somewhere between there and everybody's buying coffees. You don't need this like L1 security there, but you also don't need the whole EVM. You just need a payment model. And at the end mm -hmm. of the day, you just settle a, you know, like the, the net dis like difference between the treasuries there and the banks. And so I think that like, there's a lot of promising things, things that will come out. Um, for me, the, like the biggest, like, bull case here is that if I rewind back to my web two days and like pretend that I'm like some engineering lead and my boss and the shareholders or whoever has come to me and said, we need a web three um, strategy here. The question I ask myself is like, do I build this crap on ETH? Do I build it on Solana? Do I build my own chain? What do I do and why? And I think that if anybody goes down the rabbit hole and wraps their head around everything here, the obvious use case for anything more than just payments is that you have your own L2, you make up your own rules, and then you settle on the L1 as often as you need, like even 24 hours, like settlement time, like one, and then you pay these minimal fees, you basically get free transactions for users, and you inherit the security model. So for me, like, like, that's the coolest thing about it. And I think that if that's the one that makes the most sense from as far as like, don't get me wrong, technology readiness is not like completely there yet. But from like the theoretical bounds of what we can do with computer science and all these different algorithms that we've created and all these new primitives that we've created, that's the cheapest, most secure way to pull things off and be able to control all my dials. Right. And that goes for like mm -hmm. you know, payment stuff too, like uh, the US CBDC. Fed says it should be private. Treasury doesn't necessarily think so, but the Fed says it should be private. KYC, AML, sanctionable. You can make all that right now. And, and transactions would be super cheap. It's all private. Anything over $10,000 in a transfer or between two addresses in 24 hours can have a view key. We can turn all these dials and make everybody happy and then like root the thing every six hours in Ethereum and each user pays. We crowdsource between thousands of transactions transaction fee to get the economic security rooted in like the most security centralized place where nobody can go change it. And like, for me, like if that's where the theoretical bounds go, that's where the engineering talent goes to make it happen. And we have the most efficient system. And like a good example is like, 
I'm a big BTC guy. I love BTC. I think Satoshi's amazing. I think like solving the double spin problem was huge. Solving the coordination problem, like in the like the smallest parts, is huge. But right now, for me, proof of stake, you know, now it's working. It's showing me that you can pay less for security. So I think that any time that you you're paying more for something, whether it's transaction fees in your L2, whether it's you know uh, to to run some like highly permissioned node, whatever it is like that will eventually get eaten away because markets will become efficient. It's the same way that we now have network switches that have FPGAs in them to route traffic and to like filter packets from a DDoS perspective. We don't use the main computer, right? And we have GPUs for uh, calculating matrix math. Like anytime there's like a need for something, the most efficient engineering solution will bubble up in like a capitalist environment where you can raise and you can have freedom of information and education. And I think that crypto is like the most elegant embodiment of like look what we did with the internet and we can all talk about it and learn from it and it's all open and there's no college teaching all these things it's just like fly by the seat of your pants so many new algorithms that's you the know. weird part of it <laughs> yeah yeah that, that, they're not there yet and being security in this space is ridiculous like people oh, like ping you and they're like did you see this hack you're like dude i haven't even it got, finished my reading list from last month like this well, it thing. got it got <laughs> overwhelming because there, it's that was the only reason someone was pinging me was because something was either bad happening now or potentially bad in the future because there's a new discovery yeah so so i'm i'm being pinged about uh your camper situation <laughs> to ask you like what is that about the camper situation yeah yeah uh so is that like a security is, related thing no no this is uh i blame this on covid uh so I, i'll kind of like i'll show it a little bit so this is an airstream it's one of the like curvy yeah like, those are uh, sweet let's see if i could yeah so this is like the main hallway my office is back there there's like a kitchen this is it's opposite the the camera so yeah. right now we're uh Granby, Colorado. So the mountains are kind of behind us. I'm actually in a park. Um, so we're like hooked up, have full power, all that kind of stuff. But we're not always that way. This are you using Starlink office. right now? Right now I'm on cell, dude. Starlink has been letting me down, but it might okay. be due to the fact that I'm running I'm running a hundred girly validators and multiple mainnet validators and spoli validators out of here. So this <laughs> yeah. desktop right there and those yeah. two. There's a laptop that's running girly validators, but the rest of it, that is fuzzing right now. I guess you um, don't need heating. Yeah. Not when it's, yeah, right now, actually, the AC is on. Um, just in the middle of the day, it gets hot here, but usually, like, windows are open and that sort of thing. Oh, here's the bedroom. But, yeah, I, we're in a park right now, and the kind of the justification for that, we like to be out in the middle of nowhere. We call it boondocking is the, the term. Um, and we have, like, solar set up. We've got the Starlink. And if you're in the middle of nowhere, Starlink works great. Uh, it's when you get close to like major population zones, they have these little 12 mile cells and they get saturated. But like, I have this theory that just depending like the way that my Starlink will point, it'll orient itself. That like, it's not like beaming straight down for a cell. So like Denver's in maybe only like 30 miles as the crow flies this way. And I'm pretty sure like everybody in Denver is using my Starlink, like, you know, throughput and I'm not prioritized in this region. Um, when you're, when you have a home address, you can like, say i live here and get on a waiting list and then they prioritize you but since we're just like moving around all the time it's not the best uh, so right now i'm actually on a hot spot don't know where i put it i have a cell booster so a, a, a pole that you like unscrew and telescope out it's 22 feet high it's got a directional lte antenna some of the 5g bands um, are now like sharing like time uh like modulated positions in the lte bands and so I get 5G usually, um, point it towards the towers. I run it through the, it's a 75 ohm impedance cable, which happens to be what like satellite dishes use, like TV dish network. So there's already like a hole drilled in the airstream when we bought it that like goes to the TVs. So I like route it through that into the inside and I have a little like analog booster that just boosts like various channels. And then mm -hmm. I broadcast like a little mini cell inside the airstream because the the airstream is like a Faraday cage, dude. It's like a big double yeah. piece you know, of aluminum. Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's insane. That's definitely how much, how much is, point. Yeah. How much does your, your travel itinerary and location be dictated by your internet service? Because you're running a bunch of like yeah. up, high uptime services. Yeah. Um, I'll say this. The, the biggest deal is that there's no like good unlimited cellular plans in the u.s there's not so 
Yeah. So the way whenever we pick a spot, Google Fi is not kind of, bad, actually. It's not, but it'll throttle you down um, if you get there. And then by throttle you, I mean like it might be like where you can't load Google Maps. Like you'll get a call through, but like there won't be enough data. Um, yeah. And and they oh, wow. progressively penalize you because Google Fi is paying, you know, T-Mobile or whoever, whoever's like local to you, they're paying for that bandwidth. And then they're like, I don't know if they're cutting them on the back end. They're saying like, okay, we'll give you throughput in our fiber during you know, peak hours or whatever. I don't know how they do it. But internet's definitely the biggest pain point. Um, Starlink is is the number one thing for us. Like the, we prioritize towards Starlink because it's unlimited. And when it works, it works. It's like 200, 300 megabits a second. Um, they 35 don't... up, I think. I think they're 35 up. Oh man. Yeah, on average faster though if there's nobody around like hmm. a little bit more east into the rockies like in silverton um i can get like well over 100 up it's it's great um the one thing that you if if anybody tries to mimic this uh, you can't put hole punch so many nat pins like if you have a bunch of blockchains with way too many peers like they'll eventually limit how many like nat hole punches you get so just use a vpn for each of your nodes and then like to starlink it looks like you have like one tcp connection and then like your vpn exit will have all your peers and all that um a big life hack that i do for running my mainnet nodes is i have sitting at a friend's house in like an area with really good like some metric gigabit up down fiber i have a node that i've got like the max peer limit set for my el and my cl at like 200 plus so like 400 years across the network and i hard-coded my enr for my like local peer and that peer so like at any time they will always prioritize each other. So like if I need to connect to the internet and I'm behind a firewall, like you can't like open ports on Starlink, all I have to do is connect to my other box and I download the whole DHT for all the peers on the network. It's ready to just stream and prioritize me. So I kind of have like this like cheating, always connected like super server. I'm, cu- um, I'm curious to see like, look, look, the types of things that you're doing now um, are really going to start to, push the direction of how the like multi-client architecture both from blockchain implementations and having separate clients for the execution layer and the consensus layer and how those communicate with each other and how the individual sections link up with each other to you know kind of share information or whatever like what you're talking about is like future features across the client implementations of like, well, with ours, you can do this to make it easy for you if you want to live a lifestyle like this or something like that. Yeah. I'm very curious to see like how the different clients implementations start to differentiate themselves with respect to like feature sets and like what you can do on one versus the other. Yeah. One thing that would get me to switch right now uh, would be if a client came out and said, Hey, we added uh NAT hole punching to our lib P2P implementation so that, I could accept incoming peer requests from behind a firewall without having to open a port. Like that would know who owns the whole stack, right? Just kind of throw that out there. Which which one, the lib P2P stack? Yeah. Well, an implementation at least Uh, that also has a client. (laughs) There's a few, I think actually all of the like, sorry, Nimbus. I was going to say Nimbus just because we have, we have, we basically own the whole language. So it's it's easy to get. Yeah. Yeah. You guys had to write everything. (laughs) <laughs> from the ground up basically hey try getting try getting uh negotiating an audit a multi like a multi-client audit for that that was a really fun process it was like getting three different firms for three months to audit the entire uh like nimbus and client. everybody's booked right they're booked out like oh that was <laughs> luckily that was a while ago so like <laughs> yeah but we had to book it out for a long period of time and like spend a tremendous amount of time just getting people to understand what the scope was and understanding them and get them get them to a level of confidence where they can say yeah i'll take that job i have a a tyler on our team a security researcher had to go down that rabbit hole it's like okay new language start over right but that's kind of been everything um you know like go and rust are are pretty common i'd say java is the like oldest of the group but that's you know the clients are are go rust uh, Java, TypeScript, and and NIM, right? And so it's like all the old tricks that we had uh, for like auditing C and C++, just like throw them out the window. Like, let's start clean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I got sidetracked. Um, I think the day in the life of finding a spot is 
look on Google Maps. So first look on Campendium's an app that'll show you like RV parks and spots where you can camp and people will upload like the number of bars they get for like Verizon or, you know, AT&T or whatever cell provider. That's cool. That's, That's a nice. fallback. Yeah, definitely. If I can get one bar with my cell phone, I can get four bars with the booster and putting it up on a pole and all that kind of stuff. Um, there are some caveats. Like you don't want to be like in the Badlands or like in Utah when it's super windy and have a 22 foot pole, like as your internet service, right? When it's like, you know, 60 mile an hour winds and stuff like that. There's always like something that every new spot, you're like, Ooh, a new challenge. And if you look at it like that, um, it's a good mindset, right? It's, I, I knew a guy that, uh, he, he called life. He basically said like a trick to life is turning adversity into a game. Right. So it's like, if, if the, if the stakes are against you and you succeed, it's like even cooler. Right. So you have to look at it that way, but yeah, we find a spot. Do they have cell? Yes. Or no. If it's a park, do they have decent Wi-Fi? Yes or no. They're just like, you know, grab the whole page of reviews for Wi-Fi. And if somebody can say like, Oh, Wi-Fi is not that great. But if I sit in the office, it's great. Then that's good enough. We kind of want like a fallback. Then we look at the Starlink, go to starlink.com slash map. Is it supported area? If it is a supported area, does it have a wait list? Cause if there's no wait list, I don't have to worry about being deprioritized. Then we got to look at Google Maps satellite view. Are there too many trees? It'll block the satellite. Is there? What point does it get into the point where, like, is it pretty? Or do I want to go there? Like, yeah, I feel like that's like really far down the list right now. Yeah, well, the, well, I think the way we do it is we say, Corey. we say like, okay, I want to be in the San Juan Islands. Now start like, okay, so we've already checked <laughs> off pretty like badass place to be. Like, okay, yeah, you got to take a ferry there. Uh, I don't even know how to get an RV on a ferry. Like, we got to deal with that. Mm. But if we can find a place. They meet all the other requirements of the internet, then we're good. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, I, I have a, a really nice like Google Maps like page I share with my wife where we've like marked everything that's worked. And like, I'm like that's the one place we saw that dude with the four wheelers and the guy with the horses. And, you know, this is the place where you definitely, you know, want to, there's nowhere to, there's no dump stations. And so I don't know, it's a long list. It does get tiring. Um, I think we've gotten to this like sweet spot where we move once a month and then it's like, doesn't take all my time. I can still like go mountain biking uh, on the weekends, you know, cause you can kill a whole weekend traveling. I oh, mean, yeah. it took us, we drove from like Whistler. I went to SBC, flew back, got the RV, drove from Whistler to here in Colorado. And it took us like three days full time of driving. So like I queue up all my podcasts and like, you know, all my uh, all these like interesting books and then it's just like on the road for you know many days um yeah. but there's a lot of planning i i wouldn't try to do it alone uh like even if we're gonna stop you know you don't want to pay for a hotel when you're dra dragging your house with you so like like my <laughs> wife or i whoever's not driving will like look and figure out where we can like there's always free camping in a lot of states um be like well what's a cool place that's not far off the highway that looks really beautiful you know um and then we we just like stop and don't really like disconnect I don't even like the, all the monitors are like packed up. So the desktop's like hiding. There's like a laptop running all of my nodes, you know, like it's kind of a, an experiment to see. I mean, I could run these things in the cloud. I could run them at my desktop that's sitting in my buddy's house. Um, but I think that there's kind of like a meme behind like, yo dude, I'm, I'm literally validating on the road from, you know, cellular and satellite and solar. And like, can your Bitcoin mining rig do this. <laughs> it's kind of a so it's such a flex. Yeah, it's That's fun. Such a it's meme, definitely yeah. cool. It's very uh it's like future solar punk, cyberpunk, like I don't know. It's a let's see what we can do is kind of my mindset. Right. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. And especially now that you have like way more opportunities to do that now that the merge has happened. It's like it's it's starting to like expand your ability to experiment with like how far can you go here in terms of running or contributing to a world resource that's so big on minimal resources. And I think yeah. that's only being only capable of being done through something like proof of stake. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Man, that's really cool. I'm going to reference this podcast for when I get to that level, Corey. So like I can look back and I can be like, yeah, I started here. Yeah. Thanks. My Dan. knowledge of everything. <laughs> and I can reference, you know, three years from now. Oh yeah. I'm going to pull up that podcast with David. And I'm on the go now. And now you have a new podcast to listen to and you move every month. Yeah, dude. I, uh, <laughs> I, I like, I have, I definitely, one thing that's like growing in state besides the chain is my like to read and to listen to list. And you guys are now added to it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Sweet. So, uh, 
like what yeah, what else do you do that, that you like I feel like that takes up a significant amount of your time between security research at the consensus layer uh, you've targeted the consensus layer which is a significant amount of work and moving around the country in an RV while staking like what else what else do you get up to what do you what do you spend your time doing uh, I'm a huge mountain biker I love it uh, after the merge was successful uh, two of my teammates that were at the Boulder office with me uh, we headed to winter park mountain biked a bunch um that's kind of my like if i could pick one hobby um i would say that's it i i was uh i guess it's been it's going on 11 years been cleaned up for 10 years uh i i was like a hard drug user in high school and cleaned up and i discovered mountain biking um apart from security research and other things it just got me going it's like nature and adrenaline and fitness and like it's like a a high i think it's you know I, there's I risk involved you can run into a tree my my, yeah. one of my best friends does it and he like every time he comes back he's got like something dislocated yeah hopefully i don't end up doing that um i broke my wrist at the beginning of last summer and i hauled three bikes in the surfboard all up and down the west coast unfortunately um this this summer's been great went up to whistler in british columbia which is like probably the premier place in north america riding colorado right now um austin's the home base love live music love dancing uh austin's like brushed COVID off and everybody's gotten it and gotten over it and so now everybody just hangs out and there's a huge crypto scene there um like to hike a lot my i have a golden doodle and my wife they're hiking right now throwing the frisbee um she likes to you throw her out you're like i have a podcast you need to get the hell out of here no i'd love to show her (laughs) off she's great she makes this all fun um and my dog is just i love her name's maple um, we call her Noodle. She's a golden doodle. So Noodle's kind of her pet name. But yeah, um, she likes to bail. Like, I don't know. I think she gets cryptoed out. I think uh, especially when there's cameras out. Crypto and cameras don't go too well together all the time. I'm sure you guys have very skittish engineers that like to like kind of like shy away from your interviews all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, biking, music, traveling. Um, I think- Have you ever been to Portland at all? We drove through it like a, a few months okay. ago. We we spent a lot of time in California last year. And then um, this past summer, we like headed north. So we did like a lot of Washington State. So in the islands, um, like around Mount Olympia, Olympic National Forest, all the coastline there. We didn't like stop in, in Oregon so much just because we were like meeting a buddy up there. And our ultimate goal was to make it to British Columbia. Um, but yeah, I think okay. definitely we'll be back. The Oregon coast was beautiful. Um, Washington is very similar and we loved it. They have like this DNR land, um, department of natural resources. So they like, I guess it's publicly owned land. They like grow a bunch of trees and then they make it, they like cut it down every 30 or 40 years for like lumber and they sell it and the proceeds go to the state. So like in the meantime, they're like, Hey, there's this $30 a year adventure pass, unlimited camping on all of our lands for free. Uh, and so like, you know, you just go into these like crazy forests and, you know, we love that. And I, I, the guys I talked to said Oregon was very much like that. We did find a, a Frisbee in Silverton, Colorado. It had a number on it. I texted the dude and said, he, and I sent a picture and a pin. I was like, Hey man, found your Frisbee. And he was in Oregon and he was like, oh, damn. yeah, he was like, dude, uh, okay, I'll come get it. And he was like, Oh wait, that, that penny drops in Colorado. I was like, yeah, man. He's like, dude, I lost that in a Blackberry thicket like three years ago. And like, can't remember where in <laughs> Oregon. So just like for the meme, I was like, all right, dude, I'm bringing this shit to you. You know, and I, I yeah, we like texted the guy when we got close into Oregon and he ended up like being at work. So I dropped it off in the visitor's office and the lady at the visitor's office was like, oh, this is awesome. This Frisbee has been like, you know, all over the place, you know, like that dude lost <laughs> it. Some dude braved the Blackberry thicket to get it. Lost it in Colorado. It made its way home. So did did kind of stop a little bit there, but yeah. Um, I, That's pretty cool. I think next, like East coast is a big, you know, we've never even done it. You know, Florida is like, everybody does RV stuff in Florida, mostly like Northeasterners that are trying to escape the cold. We'll see there, but it's hot. Yeah. Hot and humid. I think we need to, to upgrade our battery storage to be able to be off grid in, in Florida. Um, running like multiple ACs will kill your budget so fast. I just got a quote for like another thousand amp hours like of lithium to basically go under this like it'll fill up like the whole area under this dinette here um and then like another 700 watts of solar and another 400 like watt external panel basically what i would need to run ac in the middle i think it's gonna be a monster (laughs) yeah it was like the quote was ridiculous it was like 37 grand or something i think it's 26 if i did it myself 
So I'm going to have to become like a, an expert on, I can do the electrical stuff. It's like drilling holes in this nice air stream. That- Careful with lithium biters though. You can, you can do some serious damage if you puncture a hole in those things or wire. Yeah. Them yeah. These things are, they're, they're pretty advanced. They like have heating elements around them. They'll like keep themselves warm and like, yeah, there's a, I'm really excited like to, to see all this stuff come out. I mean, people are running stuff in their houses. I talked to a guy the other day that lives in like, uh, except for the summer, he escapes up here, but him and his wife bought a place in Baja, Mexico. And he said he just has like infinity lead acid batteries in his basement. And so he's just running. He's got like car batteries, like running his whole house, you know, and a bunch of solar. I thought oh that was God. pretty cool. Um, I definitely love the, the, the solar punk meme, like the lifestyle. I think that's so cool. I think, uh, I think like, like I'm fuzzing, I'm fuzzing, you know, consensus layer clients right now. Um, and like, I've got my CPU like maxed out. I think like I'm using like 800 Watts and I, you know, I can run that all day off solar. I think when I find a bug, like sustainably, like the little, like, I don't know, cool, like new age engineer inside of me is like, yeah, like adversity into a game. You know, this bug was found sustainably. This proposal was validated. From, you know, <laughs> she gets upset of a check mark, sustainably found bug. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we kind of thought about like making like a little, like a non Twitter handle, like following, you know, a validator across the U S like flat Stanley, uh, but like a validator and like updating with like a, like a month delay. So you can like see where each proposal was made and like these ridiculous locations, you know, from like the top of this mountain or in the middle of the desert or whatever it is. That's funny. Let me know if you do. I'll definitely follow it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I've doxed myself already, but I don't know that it matters too much. That's Um, kind of the nice part about moving around so much is you can dox yourself and then leave and then you're fine. (laughs) David Hoffman like retweeted my, like I had a picture of my Airstream in a bunch of places with the validators. And it's like, imagine censoring this. And like, I'm not going to break any laws. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) But if I wanted to, you know, I could validate from anywhere. I rolled this baby down to Mexico if I wanted to, you know, it's just nice to have the optionality. (laughs) That's dope. So wrapping up, um, do you have any, I guess, advice you'd give to, to newcomers in terms of like how to join, how to get involved, how to learn? Yeah. My question to you is how did you go from electrical engineering to doing security research? Because I, my background is also as an electrical engineer and I'm just getting the chance to work in crypto Yeah. Um, starting this past fall, well, this past spring. So I think I the advice I can kind of answer the same. I think I can answer with the advice and then like my personal journey, like a, a brief version of it. Um, whatever gets you interested, do it. Um, I think a lot of people, like we're in a new, a new age, right? Um, information is free online. You don't have to like go to, you know, Princeton or something and, and or get a CS degree. Like I know a guy that um, he's loves ZK. He's going down the rabbit hole. He's, he's starting to program in Rust. He's never touched code before a year ago. Um, a lot of security engineers are like this. Um, some of the best hackers I knew, they just were hacking games when they were younger and all they were doing was editing the memory to keep saying 100 health. Right. And that cheat engine. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, I think that there's this industry is moving so fast that I think opportunity cost of your time is something you can throw out the window. You don't have to say like, Hey, should I focus on getting my business degree right now? Uh, because I'm a year in, or should I like go head over heels into learning this? And, and I think that there's transferable hard skills. Um, developing is one of them. So if you, if you try writing some code and the easiest language probably to like wrap your head around that would be like Python, do like a hello world in Python, how to make X in Python. Uh, I don't know anything you think is cool. I want to calculate odds for poker, Python, how do I do that in Python? Somebody's done it right now. I'm actually doing like a Python script for incentives modeling for a project. Sweet dude. Yeah. And it's, it's like you learn yourself, you learn by doing, you don't learn by an official education necessarily. Now don't get me wrong. If you have an opportunity to get a CS degree from a good school, you can learn all the theoretical stuff. You can learn everything. You still need to go do the stuff. You need to go work at a company or build your own product, but just doing is how you learn here. There's so much need. Um, You can go from like being completely unskilled to worth a hundred grand a year in like a year, if you're good and you're motivated, um, you might have to live in your mom's basement while you do it. Right. Um, but yeah, whatever gets you going for me and my journey. Um, I love the adversarial stuff. I love when it's like a chess game. It's like me versus you and security just kind of lends to that. DeFi hacks are like that. 
Like, I don't like when DeFi gets hacked, but I definitely read up on it. And I'm like, I wonder what they're like, who this guy is. I'm like imagining like, or this girl, like, are they sitting in their basement? <laughs> are they ever going to touch the money again? Who is this person yeah. who did this? Yeah. Like, I think that that's did you ever so used cool. to play PVP games? Yeah, is that, dude. is that where that mentality comes from? Okay. Dude, I played you mentioned wow. And yeah. so I was like arenas. Okay. I played battlefield on a day off on this rig okay. on Starlink. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'll get like a 40 millisecond ping. So like kind of run of the mill average. It's not real bad. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think security research, like how did I make the, the, the jump? Um, I told you, I, I, I basically nuked my hard drive. I recovered the data and I saw Kali Linux is like this pen testing distro of Linux mm. where they have all the different like offensive security tools all in like one distro pre-compiled, ready to go. I was like, what is all this? Um, I discovered all the Snowden links, uh, leaks. And I was like, yo like people like hackers are getting paid by the u.s government to like be like quote unquote good guy hackers um and like that's debatable and that's a whole nother you know discussion or whatever but like they're not going to jail and you can make a career out of this um and then i specifically wanted to like learn from those people there weren't um now there's a lot of great stuff like if you look up binary exploitation at georgia tech killer course it'll walk you through like like what is a um you know, like all the way to a heap overflow at the end from like the beginning, it's like, here's a, here's a, just a stack buffer overrun. Um, here's command injection, all the different types of like vulnerability primitives, how to exploit them. Like the, the final CTFs in the class are like literally like 10 different heap exploits and different heap allocators and how do you abuse them? So you're going through Did like- Did you do the OMSCS course? Is that I, what you're referencing? Yeah, yeah. And the, the okay, videos are online. You. Yeah, that's a killer course. Yeah. That didn't exist when I got into security research. The only way to do it was to like find a defense contractor that was selling these things to these three letter agencies and go work for a guy that had been doing it yeah. and like learn from them, right? So I, I kind of like yeah. took that path. But yeah, um, you know, it, it's there's all kinds of cool adversarial shit right now. Like MEV is amazing, dude. I see these MEV strategies- oh, or some I haven't like, touched anything like that, and so like don't, it's a rabbit hole. That. It's a it's huh? a total rabbit no, hole. It's a rabbit hole. It's highly there's a guy at SBC, and he was talking about how like a year and a half ago he was like uh, exploiting. Um, he he was just piggybacking transactions that I guess were um, in the mempool that I guess sucked a bunch of value, and he would just copy the transaction and run it, and he would just accidentally steal money. Yeah, that's called a generalized front runner. So people okay. are basically looking at the mempool and they're, they're writing like new implementations of the EVM, like in C++ and like in FPGAs. And the whole deal is like, be the fastest one to know uh, to calculate something. So they'll take a transaction and they'll say, can I replay this transaction without the dependency of who sent it and still get mm -hmm. the money? And if that's the case, I'll front run the transaction. And so what's happened is people that are submitting DeFi hacks for like hundreds of millions of dollars that are submitting them like to the mempool instead of through flash blocks, flash bots or like whoever the other block aggregators are, are getting front run by these MEV guys. And these MEV guys are, they have like little things like on Etherscan. It's like, yo, if I steal all your shit from your DeFi contract, just ping me and let me know. I'm not a thief. I'm not a hacker. I just operate a generalized front runner and I accidentally yeah. front ran a hacker hacking your contract. Like that's the kind of stuff. That's like, <laughs> I think that's so cool. So if that stuff gets you going, man, just follow the industry don't don't wait for a, a class to be like developed for you by some guy because by the time that's happened it's already going to be like too late follow the people on twitter follow who they follow look at the, the likes they like read the flashbot stuff if mev gets you going get in their discords break like use the clients and, break them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and i lost an employee today it's <laughs> uh, awesome oh thanks man yeah that was uh I think it's a great way to wrap up. I pre definitely appreciate you coming on the show and, and yeah, definitely learning both like the intricacies and, and complexity of the work you do, as well as the, the life you lead while trying to do it. So cool. Thanks for coming on and uh, be sure to keep checking you out. Awesome. And I'll keep watching these until next time. <laughs>